Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lori Lynn Turner, and um, I'm with the New School Writing Program, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Cave Canem Poetry Reading. I'd like to thank our friends and partners at Cave Canem, Allison Myers, Camille Rankin, and Haviza Jeter, who will introduce the poets tonight. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Hi, good evening. I'm Afiza Jeter, and I'm the Bloomberg Philanthropies Program Intern at Cave Canem, a national organization dedicated to cultivating the artistic and professional growth of African American poets. Since 1996, Cave Canem has been building a home for black poetry at many sites across the country. Throughout the year, we offer a lot of great programming, including Cave Canem's Poetry Prize on November 4th at 5 p.m at NYU's Lillian Vernon House at 58 West 10th Street and featuring readings from Vita Cross, Elizabeth Alexander, and Cave Canem's 2010 Poetry Prize winner, Ian Haley Pollock. Also, if you stop by the table in the back, you can buy books. You can also sign up for our mailing list to receive updates, as well as to find out about more of our upcoming events. You can also learn more about us, what we're up to, and ways to support Cave Canem on our website at CaveCanemPoets.org. I'd like to thank our, ho our hosts and co-sponsors, the New School for Public Engagement, especially Robert Polito and Lori Lynn Turner of the School of Writing. Thanks also to our funders, the Greenwall Foundation, the New York State Council of the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York, the New York Community Trust, Lila Atchison, Wallace Fund for the Arts, and the New School for Public Engagement. I would also like to thank you all for coming. Tonight, we're excited to present Cave Canem Fellows Read at the New School, featuring Cave Canem poets, Nagualti Warren, Marcus Jackson, and Camille Dungy. Nagualti Warren is the author of three collections of poetry, including Margaret, circa 1834 to 1858, winner of the 2008 Naomi Long Magic Poetry Award, and most recently, Braided Memory, winner of the Violet Haas Reed Award for Poetry. Jen Clausen says of Warren's new collection, Braided Memory, that it powerfully conveys Warren's view of heritage as a living, changing, future-directed force. Marcus Jackson's poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in such publications as The New Yorker, Cave Canem Anthology, Evansville Review, Harvard Review, and The New Delta Review. Of Jackson's debut collection, Neighborhood Register, Carl Phillips says, like Links and Hughes, Jackson, Jackson uses the clearest language to help celebrate the complexity and durability of the human will. Camille Dungy is the author of three collections of poetry. Most recently, Smith Blue, selected by Michael Waters for the Crab Orchard series in poetry, and praised by Natasha Trethewey as offering the reader a fuller view of our collective American experience. Her second collection, Suck on the Marrow, won a 2011 American Book Award and a 2011 California Book Award, a silver medal. A professor of the creative writing department at San Francisco State University, her honors include a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, two Northern California Book Awards, and two NAACP Image Award nominations. Thank you. Now go off. Thank you all for coming. Thank Kavi Kahnem for inviting me. My book entitled Braided Memory is dedicated to my grandmother. So these are grandmother poems. Um, my grandmother was born in 1905 and she passed away in 2004. She had a very long and a very interesting life. The first poem that I will read is in the section on memory, 217 South Benedict. She says, I'll stomp you. I'm four on the floor in the living room. Her foot nears my nose. She says, I've sinned. I said, God damn. Her eyes are fire. She says, I took God's name in vain. I didn't even know it belonged to God. 
the man next door uses it all the time. Company coming. In July, Aunt Minnie comes, rides the bus from DeKalb, Illinois. I learn to spell writing it over on the tablet she gives me. She tells me Minnie is not her sister, Fiend is. Still, we must prepare for her sister-in-law's visit to us. She says Minnie's marriage did not go well. Minnie has a new husband named Mel. Still, she loves Minnie, so we scrub not just the house, but make room for Minnie. Minnie Malone, the tallest woman I have ever seen, taller than the linden tree in the yard, big feet too, longer than any, wears size 10 EE. Piggly Wiggly is a bad omen. We buy what we hardly ever eat or even see, grapefruit, cherries, frozen orange juice, tea. Because of many, we have a horrible breakfast of grapefruit with red cherry in the middle, terrible. Bacon, eggs, potatoes, impossible. I want my regular cornflakes. She makes a fuss over her fancy meal, how much time it takes, and the finer things which I don't appreciate. The short way home. We take River Road down by the weeping willow trees, a shortcut from Miss Adele's house. Turn left at Tamaran. Stars jump out behind a pumpkin moon, and she says, hurry, dark is catching us. A car comes alongside us, white, shining. She catches my hand. Hey, auntie, cute little darky you got there. It's dark now, but I can see his teeth, little like pig corn. Mr. Fisher comes out his front door. Screech! That car flies around the curve. Mr. Fisher walks us the rest of the way home. I'll say, what will she say? She never will say. But any unusual surprise, like when I win the 50-yard dash at the Sunday school picnic, I'll say, young lady, you really can run. Sometimes she adds, well, like when Joe Montgomery knocked Elma Jean down the stairs, she said, well, well, I'll say. Elma Jean was 10 months pregnant, I'll say. Her first husband, George. In 1928, Blairsville, Georgia had only two black men. One was her daddy, the other her brother, Frank. White men were off limits even though one had crawled into her sister Cora's window where she welcomed him, and nine months later welcomed baby Ethel. But the family raged, would have thrown her out, but didn't know where to throw her. Their meanness convinced Iris that a black man, she said Negro, was her only choice. George Anderson came to town with the road crew to build a highway across the mountains. It was not love at first sight, but took the summer and into the fall. Her daddy disapproved because George was a red bone with sandy hair and freckles. From the city too, he was not to be trusted, but she did and they said I do by driving to Murphy and standing before the judge to proclaim their love. Gamble Valley. Moved all the colored folk, Negroes, to the valley away from the white scientist who came to the plant 
to a grove of trees into government-made flat-top houses. And black men could work in the plant, cleaning up the garbage and toxic scraps Union Carbide produced. Union Carbide made the town, owned it, guarded it with little wooden huts at the edge of Oak Ridge. Armed guards sat in those tiny huts with guns, always white, always men, always ready to shoot. She said to get in, you had to know someone. She knew Lulu and Pappy. Inside she went with her beautiful husband, George, with red hair, freckled, with, with uh, red hair, freckled skin, but Negro hair. She, good and black, always bragged about her smooth black skin before James Brown's song. Pappy could have been a full-blooded Indian, but talked black, lived black. She said he hid from white folks, just sort of blended into black to keep from going on that crying road to Oklahoma. Mac, Pappy, married Lulu Ethel. She was black and white. Black mama, the oldest sister, white daddy, who came in the window one night to love lovely Cora. Family shame made Cora insane, they claimed. Lulu was lovely in spite of being half white. By the time I knew her, she was all brown, but with black hair straight as a bone. Jobs, it's why they all came to the valley in the grove of stout green oaks. After the singing, April 1948, he loved gospel quartets and so he went, he and his daughter, but she stayed home. When they returned, she had gone to bed. When he got in, he reached for her, like always, put his leg over her and they slept until he commenced to squeeze, until she couldn't breathe, and she twisted away from him and turned on the light, twisted, screamed, and screamed at his open eyes and twisted lips, and the daughter came, and the neighbors came, and there was no house telephone, and the daughter ran from the house to get Pappy and Lulu, and when they came, George was dead. The undertaker said George had a heart attack. He was 42. One thing that my grandmother used to listen to all the time was a radio program called The Old Ship of Zion. And this poem is titled The Old Ship. Every weekday at three o'clock, she sits down to hear the old ship of Zion. I stop playing with my paper dolls, slide close to the screen door to watch as she puts a Coca-Cola on the ironing board, slides her chair up close to the radio, hums, closes her eyes and rocks, sometimes waving her hands up over her head, sometimes shouting, Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I never know what she's so happy about, and I never ask because sometimes she cries, her tears mix with snot. She wipes on her apron and she screams, what a mighty God, especially if they play Precious Lord. That always makes her cry, and she tells me why one rainy day when I'm inside and not playing on the porch. She says it's the song they sang at George's funeral. When her program ends, she is sweaty and tear-streaked. She makes me lie down for a nap while she bathes, combs her hair, puts on a clean print dress, ties on a starched white apron, puts ruby lipstick and chestnut face powder on her shiny nose and waits for him for dinner. The man, not my real granddaddy, just the only one I know. When it rains, 
When it rains, she still mops and waxes the floors, but puts down newsprint for us to walk on. When he comes in, he always walks around the paper, careful not to put his muddy boots anywhere but on the cleanly shined floor, then flops, dust rising from his overalls into the easy chair, kicks his black lunch pail across the room and sighs. Damn, they try to kill a man. She won't make him take off his dirty shoes or walk on the paper. Can't he see she's worked all day? Starched and ironed the kitchen curtains white, rubbed down the windows with vinegar? Can't he smell the neck bones stewing in the pot? She has to bargain with the stingy butcher to get fat ones. And what about the hot cornbread and pinto beans she sits before him? And she doesn't even make him wash his hands or use a napkin. He cuts an onion raw into his beans and smacks his lips, his whiskers brown with bean juice. How was it today, she asked, ignoring his elbow on the table. Same as every damn day. Man, don't you see this here, child? Don't talk like that. The only time she ever scolds is on my account, but he never listens. Mostly when I think of him, I don't remember the dirt boots or his ill manners, just his only swear. Damn. The next section is family photographs. And I will read one poem from that section. This titled, The Pork Eaters. Sunday dinner is black-eyed peas and hog moths simmered in a brown onion gravy, ready for yellow cornbread dipping and turnip greens stewed with a fat piece of salt pork, lemonade or sweet tea. And when she can find a boy to pick the blackberries, a bubbling golden brown cobbler in her great black iron pan. When dinner is done, she calls him to come, and he does, bent thin from years behind the plow, his neck lost in his Sunday go-to-meeting shirt, his eyes clouded with dreams of fertile fields they never owned. And I'll read one section from History Lessons. Hmm. The Lesson, 1776. How Great Grandpa recalled it, pass it on. Called him Rastus, wouldn't answer to it. Named his self Sitsar Chief. White folks called him a slave. He called them a lie to, to their face. Say, I'm enslaved, but ain't nobody slave. I is free. Oh, massa laugh. I just paid $500 for you, black buck. You my slave, all right. I am free from bondage and all constraints, except the ones I put on myself. This scare massa go red in the neck, his steel eyes narrow. Who you been talking to, boy? My name Sutsar Chief, been talking to God. Massa frown, oh Lord, I done bought me a fool. Chief say fools don't believe in God. Now listen, boy, you hold your tongue. He didn't. Told all who would listen he was free. Tell us we free too. We got choice even when it looked like we ain't got nary a one. Sam get mad. Say, what choice do we got? Chief say we can live or die or kill. Sam say, what kind of choice is that? Chief say, I ain't claiming the choice is good or bad or right or wrong. I'm just saying it's choice. Preacher come up behind Chief. Chief don't see. Preacher listen, 
Then tell chief, yes, you are. You are free in God. Chief turns, say, no, we is. Are be by and by. We is free in this minute. Day come when Masa say it's time to break his back talking buckra. Roped him to the live oak tree. Called us all out to see what happens to a slave who thinks he's free. Before the lash fall, chief calls out, watch me now. For I live a slave, I die a free man. You got choice. From his black, from his back, Blood oozed like black strap molasses. His solitary cry, choose, cut him down, don't let him die. Got money vested in him. Master charged Charlie with getting Chief well. But a week passed and he ain't opened his eye. Charlie, how that Rastus? He's dying, sir. Thought I told you to get him on his feet. He determined to die. Masa mad and scared, called the doctor from town, who looked and said, he done lost the will to live. Be just days before he's dead, is what the doctor said. Chief died too, just like he said he'd do. The strangest thing, when the moon is yellow and the sky is clear, folks claim they can hear Chief talking and flying home. They look at each other and smile. And the final poem I'll read is a Sestina it's from the last, um, the last section. When we move to Pico, I attend South Ranchito School, the only black among the pink and brown kids in class. Teresa Gonzalez, warns me about the kids, but not about our teacher. Tall, thin, green-eyed, and mean, whose only joy is to make us work like the Negro slave Hal calls me in social studies, making me cry before my swinging uppercut to his pug nose draws blood. Grandmother comes for the girl who beat the boy. A lady never, hisses grandmother, defends herself with her fist. What do they teach you in this here school? Fight or follow the golden rule? I live by the rule, but that boy made me cry. Calling me a slave made my temper blaze. Saying it in front of class made me whip his, shut your mouth. Miss Patterson don't even make him finish his work. Hush your mouth, stop fighting, especially boys. Just mind your teacher. Don't cause trouble and grow up to be educated just like your teacher. I gag and spit. I'd rather die than be that mop head, I say to grandmother. I can't keep coming up here getting you out of trouble. Just do the work. I don't know what's gotten into you. You used to love to go to school. Now she'll start. It's your duty, save the race, go to the head of the class, Sermon on Booker T, W.E.B., Mary Bethune, Dorothy Heights, or cry about the sacrifices others have made so I can work twice as hard, or cry about opportunities she never had that I have, never had a white teacher, and I think she's blessed. I have, I have what she couldn't, hats, gloves, class. I think to hell with that mess but I don't let it show. I don't want grandmother to preach again, but wish she could spend one day with my teacher in school. Even if she never fights, never talks, and finishes all her work, teacher will just do her like she does me, sniff her nose and give more work. No gold stars on my 100% papers, but it's a good thing she can't make me cry Crying makes me forget the rule, even though it's not taught in this crazy school. I learn what to wear, how to swear, how to style my hair, and talk soft so teacher won't send me to the chalkboard in my saddle Oxford wearing a granny-made
broomstick dress. Miss Patterson only calls on me during math class. I'm smart, so what is math? Jesus, is worse in front of the class. Sixty eyeballs piercing my back. Long division, I cannot seem to work. At the board, socks slide into my shoes. Sash comes undone on my granny dress. I try to solve, then with a sob, I don't know the answer, I cry. Stand there until you do. You're so smart, barks the teacher. For 50 minutes, kids snicker and point at me, dunce of the school. Next day, we see grandmother's wrath when she storms into math class, takes teacher by surprise, announces she is wise about her grandchild's work. I can't hear all she says, but Ragdoll hangs her head, and I strut home with grandma. Thank you. <laughs> You guys hear me? Yeah? How is everybody? Um, I want to say thank you to my fellow readers. Uh, your work is wonderful. It keeps me believing. Uh, thank you to Cave Cano, of course, a million times into eternity, and uh, the new school. Uh, I don't live in the city anymore, so any chance I get to come back, I'm on it. Um, I think I will start. Yeah, why not? Um, my family is full of drinkers. And uh, growing up, the, the bar was sort of like this mystic, wondrous place to me. Uh, so I wrote this. Uh, it's called Ode to Last Call. Shouted by the bartender in a bill collector's baritone, even the jukebox yields to you. Our bottles and glasses grow vacant as maxed out minds. Before you, we barked for hours in varnished tongues. We bet outcomes of pool table duels. We laughed like rattling wagons. We pissed in ceaseless shifts, urinals centered with soap discs. We chomped peanuts from plastic baskets. Steady snow turned the windows to slowly unrolling scrolls. Your lights flood our eyes, push broom us outside, the night air a bitten plum. Our cars wear cotton coats we brush the windshields naked of. Last call, without you, how much longer could we have eluded our homes? People we trouble and love, thoughts that luster and rust, a world that swivels tireless as if its spin won't ever encounter the wall of the word stop. Um, my paternal grandfather, I never got to meet him. He passed away before I was born. But uh, he had at least two families, possibly more, uh, simultaneously. And we all kind of found out about it, you know, eventually, of course. Um, we all end up really close. But uh, so this is my poem of sorting, just piecing together and trying to see a day in his life. It's called Escape 1961. My dad's dad glides alone in his copper Chrysler, rear fenders winged like a murderous bird, up a stretch of 23 north, flanked each side by reedy marsh. He grins. The gold bridge between two of his teeth glints in angled sun and highway wind. In the console tray, a lucky smolders like a departed thought. He can't know exactly how dank his lungs remain from a younger living dredging the coal mines. Every Saturday, he escapes to Adrian, Michigan. His white mistress, their high yellow daughter with flat black hair, who climbs the neighbor's cherry tree, bare feet and dirty fingers, as pluck by pluck 
She eats the cool crimson globes until her daddy's tires rustle the driveway gravel as if jerking her from a dream. Um, how long ago is that now? It was about six years ago. My best friend called me, and he said he was just driving around, and he had uh, unexpectedly gotten his ex pregnant, and he was trying to figure out just what he was going to do. And now this is the poem that I, it's kind of to him, but it's kind of telling lies, too. It's called Navigation. Drive toward where night clouds knuckle, moon concealed like a burglar's lucky pearl. Miles unwind under your mismatched tires. Engine valves swallow octanes protein. Radio static, a dragging long straw broom. What's out west? Rushmore, Golden Gate, Canyon, river that keeps carving like a blind miner. East, cities, ports, snubbed lantern of winter. The map refolds, roads jumble as if a suitcase of sentences. How many seasons did you and that woman wish to solve your love like an erratic crop? How many more minutes before your daughter wakes in the back seat, milk hungry, sun rising just as answerless as always? Um, I want to read two new ones. Uh, the General Grant Houses on uh, 125th and Amsterdam. I used to live right by them, and I would stop over and just sit on the bench and observe. And uh, this is uh, one of the things I saw one day. It's called uh, Project Courtyard. A newly adult couple fights about a phone. The man's phone. The message is another woman keeps sending it. The sky is dividing its last rations of light, handing them between the public-funded towers. The couple curses toe-to-toe. -to -toe. The woman holds the phone before the man's eyes like a lawyer flashing a fractured contract. <laughs> Boys playing in the developing dark control their ball and watch. A girl in a scuffed skirt halts too. The woman fires the phone against the pavement into fragments. It takes three of the man's friends to hook him back from attacking, and the woman lands a loud slap on his forehead. A police cruiser slows to stillness at the closest curb. Two officers step from dented doors, their torsos convex with Teflon vests, their belts strapped with instruments whose only note is the last word. Um, in high school, I got into a handful of fights with uh, neighborhood peers. <laughs> and I got my ass kicked, most of them. Um, but on the, on the upside of that was the pity and the empathy that you get if you have a girlfriend at that moment. So... I wanted to think a little bit about that. Uh, this poem's called Convalescence. <laughs> the finest part of losing a fist fight occurred the hour afterward, so long as you had a girl to go to. She'd sit you on the cap toilet. She'd cotton ball neosporin to your bashed brow, your split cheek, your lower lip, a scrap left over by a butcher. Her hands would weigh no more than birch leaves. Her exhales would sweep your ears like wind through creek weeds. From a radio, Mary J. Blige would be testifying. <laughs> In righteous light, your knuckles would unbind. Your arms would melt. You'd close your eyes and be some lost war wasp healing the entire night in the middle of a magnolia. Uh, 
Uh, we've all underappreciated elders and people of authority when we were young at certain points and then growing up and being like, what was I doing? He was a genius. Uh, so this is a, a poem for one of my, my teachers. Uh, it's called Eighth Grade Grammar. Mr. Bernard's bald scalp glinted as if slanted glass. With a bullet of chalk, his hand scurried the board, writing what we were to recite. Jonathan went to the grocery store to buy apples for Michael, his friend. From an adjacent desk, Damon leaned to me, whispering, he always writing on that board. That motherfucker crazy. <laughs> Mr. Bernard heard, loosened his necktie, and lettered the next sentence. Every morning, he prodded and spurred us through syntax exercises, punctuation drills, patrolling our haze-eyed ranks. We bolted away as soon as June delivered its pride crates of lengthened days, Tupac crackling from the black foam of our earphones, all our school papers trashed like meaningless mail. How would we have known to merit a man who wore inexpensive slacks, dense spectacle lenses, a man given nine months in city-bought books that smelled of stale glue, a man assigned to somehow recouple the muddled boxcars of our clauses, to re-meter our words so the world might better hear us. And the last poem I'm going to read um, is just about my reinstated love for Kool-Aid. <laughs> I gave it up, uh, I don't know, when I was 18, 19. <laughs> and then I, I went back to my parents' house to visit a few years ago, and there was a jug of it, and oh, it was good. <laughs> Ode to Kool-Aid. You turn the kitchen tap's metallic stream into tropical drink. <laughs> Every, or extra sugar whirlpooling to the pitcher bottom like gypsum sand. Purple saurus rex, roaring rockadile red, ice blue island twist, sharkleberry fin. <laughs> on our tongues, each version keeps a section like tiles on the elemental table. In ninth grade, Sandra employed a jug of black cherry to dye her straightened bangs burgundy. When toddlers swallow you, their top lips mustache in color as if they've kissed paint. The trendy folks can savor all that imported mango nectar and health market juice. <laughs> we need factory crafted packets, unpronounceable ingredients, a logo cute enough to hug, a drink unnaturally sweet so that on the porch, as the summer sun recedes, granddad takes out his teeth to make more mouth to admit you. Thank you, guys. Well, this is fun. <laughs> it is nice to be here in New York. Um, I'm, I'm far away now. And so, like all the rest of us, it's always nice to be able to drop in and visit. So thank you very much to Allison and Camille and Haviza and Kaveh Kanem and everybody who made this event possible. and. Ms. Warren and Mr. Jackson for sharing the podium with me today. It's a lot of fun. I flew in on the red eye from San Francisco and then kind of blearily got onto the New Jersey Transit trains platform and the first thing I saw was the Amtrak sign that had directions to the town where I used to live. That was the next train coming and I thought, well, I could go back there. <laughs> And then I started to think a little bit better of it. 
That's a state I'll never go back to. Once I got over the problem of not knowing how, I could not go back to not curbing my tires. But it took a while to get past forgetting to register street cleaning hours. And love, love was my handicap. Though I had no permit to hang from my rear view, so I collected seven or 10 little slips I had every intention to pay off. <laughs> Except I skipped town for the summer and returned to find the guy staying in my apartment tossed them. I'll admit, I was relieved not to face these expensive reminders of the girl I'd been, how stupid I was about life in the city. And as I'd finished school, was moving south for good this time. And as I lived then in a state of great anticipation, the potential of a record never crossed my mind. <laughs> but now, on account of those parking tickets, I can't go back there with a car. Though everyone who loves me knows I love that tiny window each October in the south nub of the state you can't reach without driving. I missed it once and waited a whole year, regretting the lost chance to track the linden leaves' tiny migrations. The next fall, refusing to endure that state of desolation again, I asked everyone who loves me to please meet me just south of the border. We ordered green mussels. We ordered popcorn shrimp. The shrimp beat the mussels to the table. I was the only one who hadn't filled up on a grande egg cream. I drink for pleasure, but since I left that state, I haven't found any delicious enough to entice. So I ate all the mussels. Crouched later in that state of betrayal that comes from learning some green things aren't good. Considering the law of averages, inertia, that any body in motion stays in motion unless faced with an equal or opposite force, peer pressure, scatology, the projected near immediate devastation of world forests should certain highly populations generally adopt the US model of toilet paper consumption, germ theory, my own role in depressing the mean average of common human hygiene, I knew I never wanted to be anywhere near that state again. <laughs> with extradition, with reciprocity, I was hardly away at all. When I first rolled over, my parents were pleased, and just as quickly I left the state of never having rolled before. Ditto slumping on all fours to crawling. And once I could walk, we all knew I was never going back. I just pulled myself up and started moving. I grabbed at everything I could reach. Until I learned better, I put my tongue on anything. Once, I ate papaya straight from the tree. And then I mourned the abject state of the crated fruit. I, living in that state, in my ignorance, thought I loved. I denounce such love. I married a local. I taught myself how to keep his garden. I swear I'm staying away from that state for good. Flight. It is the day after the leaves when buckeyes, like a thousand thousand pendulums, clock trees. And squirrels, fat in their winter fur, chuckle hours, chortle days. It is the time for the parting of our ways. 
You slid into the summer of my sleeping, crept into my lonely hours, ate the music of my dreams. You filled yourself with the treated sweet I offered, then shut your rolling eyes and stole my sleep. Came morning, and me awake. Came morning. Awake, I walked 12 miles to the six-gun shop. On the way there, I saw a bird of prayer all furled up by the river. I called to it. It would not unfold. On the way home, I killed it. It is the time of the waking cold when buckeyes, like a thousand thousand metronomes, talk time. And you, fat on my summer sleep, titter toward me, walk away. It is the time for the parting of our days. I don't actually usually read that poem. It, when I wrote it, the, the, that sort of massacre of the bird of prayer in the middle, I will admit, surprised me <laughs> um, somewhat. And, and I, I don't read it partly because I've, I've I, you know, I'm like a bird lover poet. Right? <laughs> like, um, so I have all these poems about uh, my, my adoration for the natural world and how we need to protect it and take care of it. And then, and then here I go writing six gun bird shooting poems. So. I guess I, I, part of the deal is that we have to surprise ourselves. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm doing a little fashion surprise right now. I live in California, so I've gotten rid of most of my fall weight clothes because we don't quite have that. And so I'm like, oh, wait, I've got to go to New York, and there's snow on the ground, and what am I going to do? So I go in my closet, and the only appropriate weight coat that I have right now has an awesome mink neck and, and it's not mink it's fox but there's there's a dead animal draping <laughs> all around um, my body and I and I justified this <sighs> the environmental poet walking around with dead animals by saying that it's like it's, this is the ultimate reduced reuse recycle coat <laughs> it was my grandmother's coat and so I'm sort of, it would just be sitting there in the closet, unused, or I would have to go out and buy a new coat. So I'm, you know, I'm reducing, reusing, recycling. And it's, it's nostalgia. It was, it was made for my grandfather by my grandfather, who was a tailor and a furrier. So I get, I get you know, lots of birds covered with one stone. But <laughs> then I figured if I'm going to wear my grandfather's coat, I should read the poem called Something About Grandfathers. Fit a fastener around inside and out. Twist it tight, then tighter, until intent bulges to bursting, the way an eyeball cartoon pops from the face of a strangled boy. Consider a Christmas menagerie, complete with plastic wise men carrying neon frankincense and fool's gold. Gold and something we'll call myrrh. This is how we hold on, because hope can satirize itself, yet remain sincere, devout. Your mother has you up before dawn because it's Easter. Worship before eggs and ham and all of this and that. Hold on like this, or some other way, say with a shoebox full of her father's military medals the slim portion of him you knew flattened in tin and ribbon. Hold the ribbon like a subway strap because this car is moves, shutters on rails faster than a voice floating above a staircase that belonged once to him who might call you by that pet name, might break you some brittle and calloused hands were you to climb the stairs. Hold on, who's gone? The estimated average is greater than one death per second, wave on particulate wave, incessant. Even ritual, which is what we have to cope with, breaks down like candy in a fist. Faster, soon, even this thought, fear not. 
will be gone like dust into piles, into bins, like air from the cheeks into a trumpet's bell, fuzzed by a mute into movement that charges the room electric before the old man in overalls brings out the mop. Gone like eight tracks wound down to a stretched out voice, slowing to a crawl as a tape deck shreds tape. After the car door closes to leave an echo hanging in the canyon where it was shouted, the red fields grow bird, then broken in snow. Since we're speaking about loss, I'll read a poem for the poet Linda Hull. Association copy. Maybe you sold it to buy junk, though I like to think not. And I don't want to think you use the money for food or rent or anything obligatory, practical. A pair of boots, perhaps, thigh-high burgundy boots with gold laces, something crucial as lilies. Mostly, I want to believe you held on to the book, that your fingers brailed those pages' inky veins even in your final weeks. I want to believe words can be that important in the end. Who can help the heart, which is grand and full of gestures? I have been on my way out. He was rearranging his bookshelves when in an approximation of tenderness, he handed me, like the last of the sweet potatoes at Thanksgiving, like a thing he wanted but was willing to share, the rediscovered book. He'd bought it years ago in a used bookstore in Chicago, Levine's Poems, with your signature inside. That whole year I spent loving him, something splendid as lemons, sour and bright, and leading my tongue toward new language, was on the shelf. These weren't your own poems, autographed, a stranger's souvenir. We'd spent vain months leafing through New York stacks for your out-of-print collections. But you'd cared about this book or cared enough to claim it, your name looped across the title page as if to say, please, this is mine. This book is mine. Though you'd sold it, or someone else did when you died. We make habits out of words. I grew accustomed to his, the way they spooned me into sleep so many times. Now I am sleepless and alone another night. What would you give for one more night alone? No booze, no drugs, just that hunger and those words. He gave me the names of the lost. Need comes down hard on a body. What else was sold? What else do you know did we lose? I am pleased to say that Grey Wolf brought out Linda Hull's collected works now so other poets can just go and find them. They don't have to leaf through all the New York sacks trying to, trying to locate. But there's, there's something nice about those first edition old books that we find. This is a, a bit of a California poem. The Blue. One will live to see the caterpillar rut everything they walk on. Sea cliff buckwheat cleared, relentless ice plant to replace it. The wild fields bisected by the scenic highway, canyons covered with cul-de-sacs, gas stations, comfortable homes. The whole habitat along this coastal stretch endangered. Everything, everyone, everywhere in it in danger as well. But now, 
They're logging the one stilling hawk Smith sights. The conspiring grasses, shh, shh, shh. The coriopsis, Matoni's boot, barely spares. And netted, a solitary blue butterfly. Smith ahead of him, chasing the stream. Matoni wonders if he plans to swim again. Just like that, the spell breaks. It's years later, Matoni lecturing on his struggling butterfly. How fragile. If his daughter spooled out the fabric she's chosen for her wedding gown, raw taffeta burled, a bright hued tan. Perhaps Matoni would remember how those dunes looked from a distance, the fabric balanced between her arms, making valleys in the valley, the fan above her mimicking the breeze. He and his friend loved everything, softly undulating under the coyest wind, and the rough truth as they walked through the land scratch and scrabble, and no one was there then besides Matoni and his friend walking along Dolan's Creek in that part of California they hated to share. The ocean a mile or so off, anything but passive so that even there, in the canyon, they sometimes heard it smack and pull well-braced rocks. The breeze basic, salty, bitter, sour, sweet. Smith, trying to identify the scent, tearing leaves of manzanita, yelling, this is it, here, this is it. His hand to his nose, his eyes, having finally seen the source of his pleasure, alive. In the lab, after the accident, he remembered it, the butterfly. How good a swimmer Smith had been. How rough the currents there at Half Moon Bay. His friend alone with reel and rod, Matoni back at school early that year, his summer finished too soon. Then, all of them together in the sneaker wave. And before that, the ridge, congregations of pinking blossoms, and one of them bowing, Scaring up the living, the frail and flighty beast too beautiful to never be pinned. Those nights, Matoni worked without his friend. He remembered, too. He called the butterfly Smith's Blue. thing after having lived on the East Coast with our own, with the kind of haunted histories of, of loss and such, and then I moved back to California where I'm really from and I, I was just struck again by the way that there's just this constant uh, struggle, I guess, between this kind of immensely peaceful beauty and, you know, it'll kill you. <laughs> uh, my friend who's here, I, I had a, a writing conference in, in, on the Mendocino Coast and I took my daughter and thought, oh, it'll be great. They'll sort of wander around and look at the ocean while I'm teaching classes. And Vanessa came back. She said, this is not a place to take a one-year-old. Because so they have signs up everywhere saying, beware, people die here often. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Regularly from these sneaker waves that just come up. So there you are, looking at the ocean and remembering, it will come and get you. I'm just going to read one last poem for you tonight. Um, the poem is, is, is based on a 1903 print that's housed in San Francisco, MoMA. And I was incredibly struck by the print and the title of it. And so the title of the poem is the, is the title of the print, and the process of how it was made is, is in the poem. So thank you so much. You guys are a great audience. And uh, I think there's food and drink and stuff so we can hang out and chat afterwards. The little building in which I find the ancient cloister storeroom of St. Severine, which is going to disappear. 
all that will be lost has been set already into stone from which the Madonna and her child emerged. Mary already weeping, or perhaps not yet begun. Centuries have torn the human features from her face. The storeroom she protects, centuries dismantled even those good intentions. The city turns away and concentrates on swallows. Puddles pond the patio, reflecting the three beams that buttress one remaining wall. The bird trees for nation, another unseen. The leafing will, dormant or finally done? The city turns away and concentrates on mortar. In faith, this view is but a portion of all a soul might apprehend who wandered through the past's unkept cloister some early hour before the warming spring. But here, if by here is meant now, this is all the negative developed, revealed. The city turns away and concentrates on all it must desire. One gothic archway framing a window, light crowding the left corner, overexposing the print. Gelatin silver emulsion, paper toned with broken down gold. Mary, already weeping, or perhaps not yet begun. Thank you very much. Thank you again to our readers, and thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of the evening.